This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. A couple of hundred years ago in this country, if a person missed a stagecoach, he might have to wait two or three days till the next one. Nowadays, some people become upset if they miss one section of a revolving door and have to wait till the next one. The source of this progress, of course, has been science and technology. But what about the question of science versus religion? Is it possible for a scientist to hold a religious viewpoint, or for a religionist, for that matter, to think rigorously and scientifically about the physical nature of this universe? Are they immutably in conflict with each other? Back in the 1800s, there was a certain circuit-riding preacher who was having a discussion with a somewhat skeptical physician who was scientifically minded and who was attempting to prove the utter foolishness of any and all things religious and or connected with religion. Now, the doctor said, did you ever hear religion? Did I ever hear religion itself? The preacher said, well, no, I have to admit that I haven't. Doctor said, did you ever taste religion? No. Did you ever see religion, religion itself? No, the preacher had to say. Physician went on, did you ever smell religion? No. Did you ever feel religion? The doctor said, well, yes. The preacher replied. Well, then the doctor said, if religion cannot be seen, if it cannot be heard, if it cannot be tasted, if it cannot be smelled, if religion, this that you talk about, can only be felt, I don't know why on earth you should devote your life to it. The preacher said, that's an interesting line of reasoning. He went on. He said to the doctor, did you ever see pain? I mean, pain itself. The doctor said, well, no. The preacher said, did you ever smell pain? No. Ever taste pain? No. Did you ever hear pain? I don't mean cries of pain, but the pain itself. Did you ever hear it? No. The preacher said, uh, but did you ever feel pain? Yes, the doctor had to admit. And yet, the preacher went on, you have dedicated your entire life to the purpose of relieving pain, pain which you have not smelled or tasted or in and of itself heard or seen, but you have felt it. Spiritual values, likewise, may not be known by the physical senses in and of themselves, but they are real, and they can be experienced by faith. Coming to know God, not as a theory of some sort, but as a vital living experience in daily life. One of the most famous scientists of recent times, Albert Einstein, termed his belief about the universe a cosmic religion. Einstein once wrote, and I quote him, The cosmic religious experience is the strongest and noblest driving force behind scientific research. What a deep faith in the rationality of the structure of the world and what a longing to understand even a small glimpse of the reason revealed in the world there must have been in Kepler and Newton to enable them to unravel the mechanism of the heavens in long years of lonely work. Albert Einstein referred to God as larger than the human ability to conceive him. He spoke of knowing, quote, that what is impenetrable to us really exists of trying, quote, humbly to comprehend even an infinitesimal part of the intelligence manifested in nature. And he asks, quote, how can the human mind conceive of a God before whom a thousand years and a thousand dimensions are as one? In his various writings about what he called his cosmic religion, Albert Einstein's terms for God to describe God include the infinite, the impenetrable, the rational cosmic intelligence, and God is identified with a complete and orderly rational structure in the universe. In the writings of Einstein, that's according to Dr. Edward Long. How can religion and science be said to contradict each other when Albert Einstein himself described himself as a follower of cosmic religion? And yet people continue to debate the subject. Back in 1969, the United States Supreme Court struck down an Arkansas law, 40 years old, one forbidding the teaching of Darwin's theory of evolution. The state of Tennessee had a similar law, 
but it was repealed in 1967. More recently, in the state of California, there was much talk of proposals to insist that every textbook which teaches evolution should also include the biblical account of creation so that school children could decide for themselves which they wanted to believe, the theory of evolution or the first few chapters of the book of Genesis in the Bible. I was discussing this issue with students over on campus at the University of California in Berkeley the other day, and one of them said that if every science book had to include the biblical teaching of evolution, then every astronomy course should be made to include astrology, chemistry texts should have a section on alchemy, and in the words of Dr. Ralph Gerard, a university biologist, should both views of the origin of man be presented and the children allowed to decide should a scientific course on reproduction also mention the stork theory? All this only serves to symbolize what many people regard to be an irreconcilable gulf between science and religion. But is that really so? No, the fact is that a great many men of science hold to the basics of religious faith, such as Einstein, and many such as Kepler, Newton, and Nobel laureates like Compton, Planck, and Millikan have been profound believers in God. The findings of true science as a systematic investigation of the material world, have never conflicted with the teachings of true religion, the spiritual life, of a quest after values, and for the will and the wisdom of God. Now, the entire issue of science versus religion is usually conceived in precisely those terms. Science versus, with an emphasis on that word, versus religion, as if it were a poster advertising a Saturday night tag team wrestling match, the righteous reverend versus the formidable physicist, no holds barred, three falls out of five, or as though it were a duel between science and religion. Test tubes and New Testaments at 20 paces may the best man win. But are science and religion really mortal enemies? Can a scientist believe in God? In the midst of this atomic age, some people may even wonder and be wondering whether God can still believe in scientists. After all, it may be argued... Science has unleashed the potentials of enormous destruction upon this earth in the form of nuclear weapons. But science has also given us this very radio transmitter, which I am now employing to outline some reasons why true science and true religion never conflict. And that's right, I said never. Consider for a moment Darwin's famous theory of evolution, or as some radio preachers enjoy pronouncing it, evolution since they suppose it to be such a fundamentally evil theory that it justly deserves to be pronounced that way, evolution. Well, what about Darwin himself? Would he not be a superb test of the question about whether a scientist can believe in God? Charles Darwin, the most famous exponent of the theory of evolution who has ever lived, did not believe science and religion to be in irreconcilable conflict. In fact, in the final chapter of his famous and controversial book, and incidentally, few of the people who orate with such emotional indignation about the theory of evolution have ever read Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. In the final chapter of that controversial volume, Charles Darwin writes these words, and I quote, There is a grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator. Now that's Creator with a capital C having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone circling on according to the fixed laws of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. End of quote. All right, there it was. In the last chapter of his earth-shaking book on evolution, Charles Darwin himself describes life as having been, quote, originally breathed by the Creator into inorganic matter. His lifetime of study indicated to him that there must have been some first cause, some primal genesis of life on this earth, and that its source was the Creator, capital C. Does that sound like a contradiction between religion and science? Or does it not more accurately appear to be a scientist, in fact, affirming religion? Or again, in his later work, Life and Letters, Charles Darwin, whom some religionists have dismissed as an unutterable fiend, and who for years was described from many pulpits here and abroad as an atheist and an anti-religionist, wrote, and this is a direct quote from Darwin, another source of conviction in the existence of God. <laughs> Let me read that again. Let me read the beginning of that sentence once more to be certain you caught it correctly. 
Another source of conviction in the existence of God connected with the reason and not with the feelings impresses me as having much more weight. This follows from the extreme difficulty or rather impossibility of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe including man with his capacity of looking far backward and far into futurity as the result of blind chance and necessity. When thus reflecting I feel compelled to look to a first cause, having an intelligent mind to some degree analogous to that of man, and I deserve to be called a theist." Unquote. Incidentally, the dictionary definition of a theist is one who believes in the existence of a god. Now that sounded as if it could have been a paragraph excerpted from some Parsons Sunday sermon, didn't it? The writer referred to, quote, a conviction in the existence of God, the extreme difficulty or rather impossibility of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe including man as the result of blind chance or necessity. The writer says he feels compelled to look to a first cause, and those words are capitalized, and the writer goes on to say that he is a theist or a believer in God, and the writer, the writer was Charles Darwin. The very same Charles Darwin whose book on evolution, The Origin of Species, led some people to the dismal conclusion that it was no longer possible for a man deeply committed to science to be also a believer in God. And yet this very same Charles Darwin himself, in the very book which was central to that famous controversy over the issue of science versus religion, refers to his own belief in a creator and later writes that he feels compelled by the scientific evidence he has accumulated to describe himself as a theist. How could any skeptic successfully argue that researching in the fields of biology and paleontology, evolutionary theory, and scientific studies in general will necessarily lead a man into atheism when the very scientist Darwin, whose writings engendered the controversy, said that his study of scientific facts led him to the conclusion that this universe could not have occurred by blind chance, but that there had to have been a first cause, a God, a creator of it all said the master, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free, and both science and religion in their pure forms are questing for that truth. No, far from fearing the study of science, every spiritually discerning man or woman ought to delight in it. For to one who has found and come to know the living God of this universe, every fact of physics, embryology, geology, and astronomy is confirmation of the Creator's handiwork. Each star a flame in the sky, each electron a swirling subatomic spark spinning endlessly about its nucleus, each fact and finding in the laboratory, but reconfirms and reconfirms God lives in majesty magnificent at the source and center of all things and beings. God lives. Give glory, praise, and honor to this living and eternal, beginningless, endless Father of all men, the everlasting God of galaxies and molecules of all mankind and of you. The infinite God is the architect of all time and space, and yet, and yet, a fragment of his very being lives within the human soul. For a son or daughter of the eternal God you are, and to know that, and to live in that faith, is really to begin to live. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something, simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.